Vani Prachari Ne Nirvise Shashanyavadi Pascha Chiri Satari Ne Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayeva Cha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam uh, second canto, and we're on chapter number eight today. <coughs> so, those of you who were with us in the last class, we we were hearing how Lord Brahma had given the transcendental knowledge to Narada Muni, and then he requested Narada Muni that he should expand it. He should distribute it. So when Maharaj Parikshit heard this, then Maharaj Parikshit was inspired to ask from Sukadeva Goswami that uh, what did he do with it? How did he uh, how did he expand it? Where did he go? Who did he give it to? So this was some of the thinking of Maharaj Parikshit. He wants to understand more from Sukadeva Goswami. Let's read the first verse here, chapter number 8, text number 1. How did Narada Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord, who is without qualities, and before whom did he speak? Before whom did he speak? In other words, who did he deliver this knowledge to? So the point is made in the verse that Lord Brahma is described as being very fortunate. Lord Brahma's good fortune was that he'd been given transcendental knowledge by the Lord himself. And that same knowledge was passed on to Narada Muni, because Narada Muni is the son of Brahma, so he got the knowledge very nicely. And we'll hear what is that knowledge. We'll hear in the next chapter, the original four verses of the Bhagavatam. So the, the point is made that the Lord is without material qualities. That is, quality meaning guna, so he is aguna, he's without material qualities. Prabhupada writes in the purport there, at the end of the purport, Whenever therefore the Lord is described as aguna, or without any quality, it does not mean that he has no quality, but that he has no material quality, such as the modes of goodness, passion and ignorance, as the conditioned souls have. He is transcendental to all material conceptions, and thus he is described as aguna. Of course, this point is difficult for the ordinary person to understand, and impersonalists, mayavadis, they will speculate on this. They cannot understand how the Lord can be a person and at the same time without qualities. They don't understand that there are such things as spiritual qualities. So this is the important point to be appreciated, yeah? As well as the fact that the knowledge which is being passed on from the Lord 
is coming through the disciplic succession. So text number two then describes, Maharaj Pariksit continues, I wish to know narrations concerning the Lord who possesses wonderful potencies are certainly auspicious for living beings in all planets. O oh, greatly fortunate Sukadeva Goswami, going on to text number three, please continue narrating Srimad Bhagavatam so that I can place my mind upon the Supreme Soul, Lord Krishna, and being completely freed from material qualities, thus relinquish this body. So we see at the beginning of this chapter, Maharaj Pariksit's very intense absorption. Naturally, when you're preparing for death, at this, at this particular point in his life, where he knows he has only seven days left to live, he's very intense, very serious. He wants to hear very carefully. And he's asking to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We have heard in the very second chapter of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Riti Antastohi Abhadrani Vidunoti Suritatam. That by hearing the topics of Krishna, that's it, it's a pious activity. Not like Punya Shravana Kirtana. Simply by hearing the topics of Krishna. And it cleanses the heart of all the contamination. So Maharaj Pariksit is eager like that. He understands the potencies of hearing the topics of Lord Krishna because Maharaj Pariksit himself is coming in a family, a line of devotees. He is the grandson of Arjuna. So he's very deeply connected to great devotees. And Sukadeva Goswami, as the son of Vyasadeva, is also equally devoted. So it's very appropriate for the two of them to meet. And it's very appropriate for Sukadeva Goswami to be giving this instruction of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because he himself had the opportunity to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam from his great father. So Maharaj Pariksit wants to prepare himself for the end of his life and he wants to get freed, he said, completely freed from all material qualities and thus relinquish the body. So he's begging Sukadeva Goswami, Katayashva Mahabhago. Right? Continue speaking, O oh great soul. Continue speaking. This is the mood of the devotee. Devotees are eager to hear. Maharaj Pariksha is so eager to hear. He's given up eating. He's even given up drinking. He doesn't even drink water. He's just simply, he, he just wants to fully concentrate on hearing the topics of Lord Krishna. This is the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. People wonder, how is it possible he could live for so many days without drinking even water? If you don't drink water, you'll go mad. How did Maharaj Pariksit manage to do it? That for seven days and nights he didn't drink or anything. He did it because he was constantly hearing the topics of Lord Krishna. Because his mind was so fixed in hearing the topics of the Lord, he was able to conquer over the bodily urges.
Prabhupada writes at the end of the text, end of purport, text number three, that Maharaj Pariksit had already given up all his connections with his kingdom and family, the most attractive features of materialism. But still he was conscious of his material body. He wanted to be free of such bondage also by the constant association of the Lord. We saw Srila Prabhupada also, as he was preparing to depart from the world, he also uh, completely freed himself from all attachments to anything in this world. He took a ring off his finger and he gave it to devotees that this is for, I think one was to be given to George Harrison. And then he gave his watch to Upendra, who had been his servant. And then he assigned different devotees to take care of the different properties of the society. That was, the society was like Prabhupada's kingdom. His family were the devotees. So he gave, he made all arrangements for everyone that they could continue in his absence. And when his god brothers came, Prabhupada's god brothers came because they could understand he wouldn't be in this world much longer. So they came to meet him and to offer their respects to him. And at that time, Srila Prabhupada asked them, he begged them, he said, please forgive me for all my offences. He said, if I've offended any of you, he said, please forgive me. He said, sometimes in my preaching, sometimes I spoke very strongly. So if you were offended, then please forgive me. And, but they, they all said, no, no, Swamiji, you, you spoke very well, you spoke powerfully. It's all right, you didn't, were not offended. And it was, it was very nice, very cordial mood. But Prabhupada, for Prabhupada, Prabhupada was also teaching us the importance that before we leave this world, we shouldn't be keeping something in our heart or in our mind. I remember also His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami when he was leaving the world. Remember, he was in, he, he left the body in Gita Nagari. He was dying of cancer. And so he, he was talking also, he said, you don't want to keep anything in your heart before at the time of death. You, you want to get completely free of any kind of, if there's any bitterness or any bad dealings or any grudges or anything, you want to get rid of everything from the heart. You don't want to take these kind of feelings with you at the time of death. So it's very important to relieve yourself of any of these kind of feelings or uh, problems which we may have with people. We want to get rid of these things and put them aside. And that way, then we can properly prepare ourselves for leaving the body. So Maharaj Parikshit, he's also in a similar situation. He's preparing himself. And he just wants to be able to focus fully on hearing the topics of Lord Krishna. So he's glorifying the hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 4 describes persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna manifested in their heart within a short time. So hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, we say, Srimvatam Nasta Praesva Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya by regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and rendering service to the pure devotees, all that is inauspicious in the heart can be eradicated. So very important for us. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said, it shouldn't just be a Bhagavat Sapta. Of course, that's also good. You hear the Bhagavatam for seven days. 
But that is not going to get you perfection. You have to hear regularly. You should be willing to hear daily. It's not enough to just simply hear for seven days. You come for seven days and think, oh, now I've heard Srimad Bhagavatam, now I'm liberated. So Srila Prabhupada did not encourage that kind of speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam. He wanted that Srimad Bhagavatam should be re regularly recited. Just like taking medicine, you can't expect you're going to, going to get cured just by taking medicine one time or every day for a week. You know, you're going to have to, usually you have to take a course of medicine, it may go on for a month, it may go on for several months. Bhakti Chaitanya Swami was recently in poor health and uh, he was diagnosed as having some blood clots in his legs. And he wrote, uh, he was writing to the devotees on the internet and he wrote about, he said he has to take medicine to thin the blood and you have to take it for six months. So that's the kind of thing, that's just for things in, with the material body. So how much more we have to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to make the Srimad Bhagavatam a very central thing in our life. We want to be hearing it regularly. And Prabhupada said, for one who hears the Srimad Bhagavatam, one who studies the Srimad Bhagavatam, then one day they will see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, going ahead, text number five. The sound incarnation of Lord Krishna, the Supreme Soul, in other words, Srimad Bhagavatam, enters into the heart of a self-realized devotee, sits on the lotus flower of his loving relationship, and thus cleanses the dust of material association, such as lust, anger, and hankering. Thus it acts like autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water. The autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water. When the, in the autumn season when the rain falls on the muddy water, then it clears the water. Water becomes clear. So the same way, when we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, when it enters into the heart of the devotee, then it cleanses all the contamination, like lust, anger, hankering, these things. So Prabhupada's purpose is very powerful. Please listen. It is said that a single pure devotee of the Lord can deliver all the fallen souls of the world. That's a very powerful comment to make. A single pure devotee. How is it possible? Prabhupada explains, one who is actually in the confidence of a pure devotee, like Narad or Shukadeva Goswami, and thus is empowered by one's spiritual nature, just as Narada was by Brahmaji, can not only deliver himself from maya or illusion, but can deliver the whole world by his pure and empowered devotional service. Then Prabhupada describes the analogy which is given about the autumnal rains. During the rainy season, all the waters of the rivers become muddy. But in the month of July, August, the autumn season, when there is a slight rainfall, the muddy waters of the rivers all over the world become clear. In the same way, a pure devotee of the Lord can deliver not only his personal self, but also many others in his association. 
right? It is said we can understand who is a Vaishnava by how many devotees has he brought to Krishna consciousness. How many people has he brought into the Krishna consciousness movement? Devotees should be like a touchstone that wherever he goes, other people also become devotees. So this is the thinking. We want to create pure devotees like this. Prabhupada would also sometimes say, one moon is better than many stars. You may have many stars in the sky at night, but still it won't be very clear, nothing, you, nothing will be very clear in the night. Just because you have a lot of stars in the sky, it's not going to light up everywhere. But if there's a moon, then that one moon, that can light everything. So the same way, there may be many devotees, but they may all be mixed devotees. In other words, they have all their material desires, material attachments, they're not very fully committed to Krishna consciousness. But if you have one pure devotee who is really fired up, who is really thinking about distributing Krishna consciousness, then that can make a big difference, just to get these kind of devotees. So Srila Prabhupada was like that, of course. And Srila Prabhupada also wanted to create more devotees like that, to follow his example. So, reading a bit more of Prabhupada's purport here. In other words, the cleansing of the polluted heart by other methods, like the culture of empiric knowledge or mystic gymnastics, can simply cleanse one's own heart. But devotional service to the Lord is so powerful, it can cleanse the heart of the people in general. By the devotional service of the pure, empowered devotee. A true representative of the Lord, like Narad, Sukadeva Goswami, Lord Chaitanya, the six Goswamis, and later Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srimad Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, etc., can deliver all people by their empowered devotional service. We see in Chaitanya Charitamrita the same message is taught to us about propagating the chanting of the holy name. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's one verse which says, Kali Yuga Dharm, Kali Yuga Dharm Krishna Nam Sankirtan, Kali Yuga Dharm Hari Nam Sankirtan, Krishna Shakti Vininahi Tara Pravartan. That in order to propagate the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, you need to get Krishna Shakti. You have to be empowered by the energy of Lord Krishna. And then you can properly send the holy name everywhere. So that empowerment has to be there. Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like in the court of law, a person may be involved in some legal case, he may empower his lawyer to go there and plead on his behalf. So the lawyer goes and puts in a plea on behalf of his client. So the same way the devotee is like the representative of Lord Krishna and he's propagating the holy name. He's authorized, the authorized representative of Lord Krishna, he can distribute the chanting of the holy name. Of course, they have to be properly qualified. So Prabhupada mentions here, you can see the, the names of the devotees Prabhupada mentioned, Narada, Sukadeva Goswami, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Lord Chaitanya, six Goswamis, not ordinary souls, very, very great souls. And they're all engaged in preaching on behalf of the Lord. And they became so powerful because they sincerely followed the Bhagavata principles. 
right, the principles of the Bhagavatam by regularly hearing and worshipping. What is that? What are, are the principles of the Bhagavatam? It doesn't mean that you have to change your ashram. That's not required. It's not a change of ashram which is required. And Prabhupada would quote the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, prayers by Lord Brahma. So, very important verse, because it describes how we can actually practice the principles of Bhagavatam. And Lord Brahma says, Stane stita, you stay in your position. You don't change your varna or your ashram. You just stay in whatever position you're in. Stane stita, shruti gatan tan But hear about Krishna in the association of pure-hearted devotees. And the result of that is jita jito piyasita istrilokyam, that Lord Krishna is a jita, he is unconquerable, but he becomes conquered by the pure love of his devotees. When the devotees are really convinced to hear the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, uninterruptedly and regularly, without any material motive, then Lord Krishna becomes conquered by that pure-hearted mood. And this is how the devotee himself becomes empowered for in order to dis distribute the message of the Bhagavatam. So this is the principle of Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is a way in which we can also clean our heart. We want to clean our heart, we have to do this pro we have to take up this program regularly. Not once a week, every day. When Prabhupada gave us the sandwich program. In the morning, Srimad Bhagavatam, in the evening, Bhagavad Gita. Like there's a sandwich, a spiritual sandwich. In the morning, hearing, chanting. In the evening again, hearing, chanting. In this way, our heart becomes very pure and we become strongly inclined to do devotional service. All right, text number six continues the glorification of the process of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. A pure devotee of the Lord, whose heart has once been cleansed by the process of devotional service, never relinquishes the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, for they fully satisfy him, as a traveler is satisfied at home after a troubled journey. It's a very nice example, a nice analogy given at the end of the verse. Just like a traveller is satisfied at home after a troubled journey. Sometimes you may go out for travelling, you may go to Calcutta or you may go to Delhi or Vrindavan, you're move, maybe you're moving around, visiting different places. You may go to Patna to see our temple there, Bihar, or you may go to Ganga Saga, there's a nice temple coming up there. You may be moving around to different places. But the time when you're most comfortable is when you go home. You can go back to your own place and take a rest and relax in one place. So the same way. A devotee, he just simply holds on to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. 
He doesn't have to go anywhere else because taking shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna is so satisfying the devotee doesn't want anything else. Okay, text number seven. O learned Brahmana, the transcendental spirit soul is different from the material body. Does he acquire the body accidentally or by some cause? Will you kindly explain this, for it is known to you? So now we're going to hear Maharaj Pariksha's questions. We've heard him glorify the process and he spoke about the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam and hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. And now he himself is going to make his own inquiries, what he wants to understand. This is all part of the process of approaching the spiritual teacher. Just like in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Lord uh, Arjuna surrendered to Krishna by saying tadvidi pranipadena pariprasnena sevaya upadeshyanti te jnanam jnaninas tadvadarshana that Ar Arjuna wanted to approach Lord Krishna to understand the truth so Lord Krishna told him just try to learn the truth by approaching the spiritual teacher and inquire from him pariprasnena right the word is there Tadvidi pranipatena, pranipatena meaning fall down without reservation, without consideration, submit yourself, and then pariprasnena, put questions before the spiritual teacher. And finally, pariprasnena sevaya, inquire. So this is all part of the duty of the aspiring candidate for devotional service that we come to Krishna Consciousness and we should come in a humble mood. We should come to learn. We should not come in a challenging spirit, but we come in a humble manner to submit ourselves, And we are encouraged to put questions, to inquire, to inquire not about mundane topics, but about the nature of the Absolute Truth. So this is the the process of approaching the spiritual teacher. This is how we get transcendental knowledge. So Maharaj Pariksha is making his first inquiries. He wants to know, does, did we get this body accidentally? Because we have a material body, but we're spiritual beings. We're all spirit souls. So Maharaj Pariksha knows we're all spirit souls. He understand, but he understands we have a material body. So he wants to understand, did we get this body accidentally? Or was there a reason why we got this material body? So this Maharaj Pariksha says to, says to uh, Sukadeva Goswami, kindly explain this, for it is known to you so Maharaj Pariksit had confidence that whatever he was inquiring about, Sukadeva Goswami would be able to reply that he was a very, very enlightened soul. Hmm. Going on into the, into the purport here, text number eight, or text number seven it is, sorry, still in text seven here. In the first, second, third paragraph, in the third paragraph it says, in the process of devotional service, first step is to take shelter of the spiritual master and then inquire from the spiritual master all about the process. This inquiry is essential for immunity to all kinds of offenses on the path of devotional service. We know in chanting the holy name, the first offense is there, 
to blaspheme the devotees who've dedicated their lives for the propagation of the holy name. So here we're told that inquiry will make us immune to offences on the path of devotional. You know, you, without knowing it, we may be committing offences. We see there are examples like that in the scriptures. Rupa Goswami, without knowing it, he committed some offence against a man. And because of that, he was not able to meditate fully on the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So there are problems like one, we have to be very careful. How to get immune from offences? Inquiry. Making inquiries. Of course, inquiries is not the ultimate goal. People may inquire for some time and then they go away. They, and why do they stop coming? And they say, oh, no more questions. Questions are finished. But they're meant to take up devotional service. They may be hearing and not being affected, not taking up the instructions. So this is not good. Prabhupada writes, even if one is fixed in devotional service, like Maharaj Parikshit, he must still inquire from the realized spiritual master all about this. In other words, the spiritual master must also be well versed and learned so that he may be able to answer all these inquiries from the devotees. Thus, one who is not well versed in the authorized scriptures and not able to answer all such relevant inquiries should not pose as a spiritual master for the matter of material gain. It is illegal to become a spiritual master if one is unable to deliver the disciple. So this is the responsibility of the spiritual master. We're meant to bring the devotee out of ignorance, bring them to the transcendental platform. And the, the media, the process of bringing the devotee up is, is through this exchange question and answer business. The, the disciple will put questions before the spiritual teacher. We see Prabhupada published that one book where he met the, the young man, there was one man called Bob Cohen, and he was here in, in India. He was a young American man at the time, and he was in India, he's working for the Peace Corps, and he met some American devotees, and he was puzzled, interested, so he came to meet Prabhupada. He went out to Mayapur, and he stayed in Mayapur a few days, and he met with Prabhupada, and he put many questions to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada liked very much, and Prabhupada told them to publish the conversation as a book. Perfect questions, perfect answers. So that is the business of the disciple. First of all, disciples should put intelligent questions. Prabhupada writes in the purport of text 34 of the fourth chapter, that the questions from the disciple should not be challenging questions. They should not be foolish questions. Do you, do you know what a challenging question is? Anybody would like to give me an example? What's a foolish question or a challenging question? Have you ever heard these kind of things? Anybody know? Can give an example? Not that you're foolish, but you should know what is a foolish question. Anybody? Like, like foolish questions, like about mundane questions, uh, sometimes they ask, like how can uh, I, uh, like devotees sometimes ask such questions, like how can they recover from illness or uh, or uh, some business, uh, like has uh, there's some fall down business, that how can they improve these things also? Material questions like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, someone asked me, where is the God? Show me the God. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, 
<laughs> that's quite a, a normal question. I don't know, uh, yeah, we could say that's challenging a little bit, but what, what, what would you say to such a person? How would you respond to that? Somebody says, show me the God. If there's a God, show me him. Uh, yes, we, uh, anyone uh, who has, uh, uh, we can see the God only by uh, spiritual eyes. So whenever we do not have the spiritual eyes, we cannot see the God. God is everywhere, but we had not uh, these type of eyes that we can see the God. Mm -hmm. First, we should develop our uh, senses in spirituality, then we see the God. Okay. Yes, if we purify ourselves, then one day we may see God. And Prabhupada would answer these questions in different ways. I, I remember one time somebody said, uh, why can't we see God? Prabhupada said, why you give so much importance to seeing? Why can't you hear? God is speaking. He's speaking the Bhagavad Gita. Why can't you hear him? He's speaking in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharmam Parigyasnam Mamikam Sharanam Braja. He's telling you to surrender. Why don't you hear? And then other times Prabhupada would say, Who has not seen God? God is the light of the sun and the moon. He's the taste in water. He's the syllable Om and the Vedic mantras. He's everywhere in so many things. These are some ways which Prabhupada would sometimes answer this kind of question. Other foolish questions would be like, can God make a stone so heavy even he can't lift it? It is quite a common question asked by atheistic, stupid people. You understand? Can God make a stone so heavy that even he cannot lift it? Yes? Everybody understand the question? Yes, Maharaj. Can you answer? Uh, one time Rupa said that, okay, Krishna won't lift it, but Balram will lift <laughs> Balaram will lift it, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, Krishna cannot uh, lift it, then again he will expand and then he will lift it. Right, yes, right. Prabhupada said like that, yeah. Prabhupada said, he, will, he won't lift it, and then he will expand and lift it, and then he won't lift it, and then he'll expand and lift it. Yeah, ongoing. Because Krishna's qualities are always expanding. So the material world is very static, doesn't change much. But the spiritual world is dynamic, it's always changing. We always get new places, new opportunities. with Krishna. Another way of answering this question about did, did, uh, can Krishna make a stone even he can't lift it, we, we could say that yes, uh, you are that stone because you ask such a stupid question. <laughs> because you're so stupid, you ask such a stupid challenging question. So you're just like that stone that even though Krishna comes to give you the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, still you won't take it, you won't take advantage to hear it. He's trying to pick you up, but you don't want to come up. You want to stay down in your ignorance. So like that, yeah. We have to know how to deal with these different kinds of challenging questions. In the beginning of our movement, we, see, we saw that Prabhupada would like questions and he would encourage questions. But then after some time, at the, towards the end of Prabhupada's manifest time, he didn't want questions. He would just talk, give the lecture and that's it. And he'd let the devotees, let the senior, my senior disciples answer the questions. Because so many foolish questions. Sometimes people were envious even. They say, Swamiji, you, you have to sit on a big seat. We're all sitting on the floor. You have a big seat. And Prabhupada would say, are you envious? <laughs> yes, definitely they were envious. So this kind of, Prabhupada didn't like these kind of things. It's not good for people. So Prabhupada would just talk often. 
talk and do a little bit, a little bit puja and let people chant and take prasadam. That's the main thing. Particularly in Australia, Prabhupada wanted a lot of prasadam distribution. He thought prasadam distribution would be very helpful for a lot of people, materialist, materialistic minded people. Okay, so going ahead, text number eight. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead, from whose abdomen the lotus stem sprouted, is possessed of a gigantic body, according to his own caliber and measurement, what is the specific difference between the body of the Lord and those of common living entities? Oh. He's got a number of questions. Text 9. Brahma, who was not born of a material source, but of the lotus flower coming out of the navel abdomen of the Lord, is the creator of all those who are materially born. Of course, by the grace of the Lord, Brahma was, not, was able to see the form of the Lord. So Brahma was able to see the form of the Lord by the grace of Krishna. Because he'd already done a lot of piety, a lot of purity, a lot of austerities and so on. Therefore, he got the grace of the Lord. And Prabhupada says in the purport, One thing is, however, certain. Brahma was completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord. Because after his birth, he could create living beings by the Lord's grace only, and he could see the form of the Lord. Whether the form seen by Brahma is of the same quality as that of Brahma is a bewildering question. Maharaj Pariksit wanted to get clear answers from Sukadeva Goswami. Text 10, please also explain the personality of Godhead, who lies in every heart as a super soul and as the Lord of all energies, but is untouched by his external energy. So the external energy of the Lord, the material energy, certainly this is the Bina Prakriti Ashtada. Right? The separated energy of the Lord, not very dear to the Lord. But the super soul is in the heart of every living entity. So, is he going to be touched by this material energy? So this required explanation. Text 11. It was explained that all the planets of the universe with their different governors are situated in the different parts of the gigantic body of the Virata Purush. I have also heard that the different planetary systems are supposed to be in the gigantic body of the Virata Purush. What is their actual position? Will you, ex will you please explain that? So we spoke about the Virat Purush on the first day. We heard about the Virat Purush and how everything is there within the Virat Purush, different elements, different parts of the body of the Lord are all there within the Virat Purush. Text 12. Please also explain the duration of time between creation and annihilation, as well as the nature of time indicated by the sound of past, present and future. Also, please explain the duration and measurement of life of the different living beings, known as the demigods, the human beings, etc., in different planets of the universe. Prabhupada's purport, past, Present and future are different features of time to indicate the duration of life for the universe and all its paraphernalia 
including the different living beings in different planets. We say life is not limited to this one planet. Life is everywhere, all over the creation. It's foolish to think there's only life on this one planet. But still, this is often taught, even in schools and so on. They have a very empirical approach to understanding the origin of life and the nature of life within the universe. We want to understand everything guided by scriptures. We have to hear from the scriptures. So Prabhupada is explaining, well, he's repeating the words of Srila Vyasadeva, which were actually spoken by his sister, who had actually come. So we see that from these questions, we can see immediately that this Maharaj Parikshit is very inquisitive. And that is also a very good qualification four kinds of pious people surrender to Krishna. Chatur vidā bhajanti mam jñāna sukriti no arjuna arto jignāsur artati jñāni ca varatāśava. So four kinds of people for reasons. Some people come in distress, some come in search of knowledge, some come out of, uh, out of the Sankirtan movement. They come from the Harinam Sankirtan. And other people may come in search of knowledge, transcendental knowledge. And Jignasu, people are curious. They just want to inquire. They want to ask, what is this? What is that? I have many questions. So inquis inquisitiveness is very good qualification. It brings what can bring one into Krishna consciousness. So therefore, Maharaj Pariksit, he shows his uh, sincerity that he's very inquisitive. He wants to know about all of these things. And he wants to know also about Lord Krishna and everything in relation to Krishna. It's very important for him because he, he has nothing else to do nothing else to think of. He's just simply preparing for the end of life. And Prabhupada said, the end of life. He said, you can come, sit down in Vrindavan, read the books of the Goswamis. You go out your whole life and preach, and the end of life you come back to Vrindavan and you sit down and read the books of the Goswamis. That's the end of life. But while you're still young and in the life, you want to make use of your life for inquiring and hearing. Maharaj Parikshit had been busy. He'd been the emperor. He'd been ruling the world. He did not get the chance to really hear or to inquire Srimad Bhagavatam. Therefore, when he got news of his impending death, then he immediately took that opportunity. I have to give this up immediately. I have to get out of here. Because the longer he stays there, the more entangled everything would become. Okay, text 13. Please also explain the cause of the different durations of time, short and long, as well as the beginning of time, following the course of action. So time, one of the five things which was discussed in the Bhagavad Gita, you'll remember, right? There was Ishwara, Jiva, Prakriti, time, and Karma. Karma. Yes. And of the five, one is not eternal. Which one is not eternal? Karma. Karma. Yes, right. Karma is not eternal. Karma. Karma can be destroyed. 
karma can be created and destroyed. So, not so important, but time. And Krishna himself says in, in 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Kalos mean lokashaya krit pravridho. He said, time I am destroyer of the worlds, but for you I come to claim all powerful men. So time, the element of time is quite a big topic in Srimad Bhagavatam. There's several discussions on the nature of time, a calculation of time from the atom, things like this, are all described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Then again, text 14 goes on, kindly describe how the proportionate accumulation of the reactions resulting from the different modes of material nature act upon the desiring living being, promoting or degrading him among the different species of life, beginning from the demigods down to the most insignificant creatures. Who are the most insignificant creatures? Yes? Anybody know? Make a guess. And Indra Gopa. Indra Gopa. Indra Gopa, yes. Could be Indra Gopa, that's right. Tiniest gem that bears the name Indra Gopa, mentioned in the Brahma Samhita prayers, right? Hmm? Okay, so Maharaj Parish's questions show his uh, enthusiasm to hear and to inquire. He was, he's very, he's, he's got many questions he wants to know. It's important for him because he you knows he's leaving the world. He's not got long to live. So it's very important that he gets all of these doubts out of his mind. Any questions he may have, he wants to remove everything. That's very good. So he's, he's asking these questions, he's very enthusiastic. He's very intelligent also. He's got really deep, searching questions. So he's a very qualified person. He want, of course, he wants to make sure he can go back to Godhead. So, he's asking for his own purification, as well as for the benefit of all of us. And we should also understand, it's important for us to get rid of the influence of the lower modes of nature. If we want to enter into the Kingdom of God, we have to get free of the modes of passion and ignorance. Otherwise, there's no way we can get into that spiritual world. You're not going to get into Vaikuntha, you're not going to get into Goloka. You just simply stay in the material world. So we have to get free of the passion and the ignorance. Otherwise, we don't have any hope. And some people, they want to go to Pitriloka. I don't know why, they, why would they want to go there? They're attached to their forefathers. Or they think that is the goal. Krishna just covers up the mind and the intelligence of people in this way. That they think the goal is to go to Pitriloka. Or they think the goal is to go to Swargaloka. They have these different misconceptions about understanding Krishna Consciousness. They're thinking that's the goal. So that is not, of course, pure devotional service. If you want to go to Pitri Loka or you just want to go to heaven, that is not the pure message of Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, going ahead, text 15. Please also describe the creation of the globes throughout the universe, the four directions of the heaven, in other words, 
the, the sky, the planets, the stars, the mountains, the rivers, the seers, the, or the seas and the islands, as well as their different kinds of inhabitants, how it all takes place. So Maharaj Pariksit wants to know about everything, really, yeah? He's not leaving anything. He wants to know about the whole thing. What, how is it all going on? Prabhupada said, there is a great plan behind the arrangement. Maharaj Parikshit requests the great sage Sukadeva Goswami to explain all these authoritatively in accordance with proper understanding. So people may know something, but they may not, it may not be authorized, it may not be coming through the proper channel. But if we, if we stick to the, the parampara, if we follow the principles, we should be okay. I know nowadays, you know, there's so many restrictions about where you can travel, and where you can't, and what you have to do to go here and go there. So similarly, even in the times of Lord Krishna, you wanted to go somewhere, you wanted to go higher planets, you wanted to go around the globe, there's some restrictions. You have to be qualified. You want to go into heaven, you have to have a lot of punya karma. If you don't have punya karma and you just go there by some mechanical means or by someone's mercy, you won't get in. You won't be able to stay. Prabhupada writes in the purport, text number 15, even in human society, the inhabitants of the jungles or the deserts are different from those of the cities and villages. They are so made according to different qualities as the modes of nature. Such adjustments by the laws of nature is not blind. There is a great plan behind the arrangement. Maharaj Parikshit requests the great sage Sukadeva Goswami to explain all these authoritatively in accordance with proper understanding. So Prabhupada is pointing out to us there's a great plan behind the universe. All these planets and stars all in position and moving in a very specific manner, a very uh, intensely uh, um, what do they say? The dining, the, the movements, the dancing, the choreographer, the person who arranges the dance, it all has to be done very carefully. So the same way within the universe, Lord Krishna has set up this whole universe. So many living entities, so many planets, so many people. We have to be very careful to keep an eye on every devotee. We can go off very easily. So then Maharaj Parikshit asks, text 16, describe the inner and outer space of the universe, as well as character and activities of the great souls, characteristics of the different classifications of the castes and orders of social life. Wow, Maharaj Parikshit is really inquisitive, he's really getting into things, he really wants to know about everything. This is this is the enthusiasm of the pure devotee. They want to know everything in relation to Krishna. And it is, the whole creation is all in relation to Krishna. Devotees see everything in relation to Krishna. And Prabhupada in the purport, he talks about Krishna's pastimes. He said, in the second paragraph, he said, Lord Krishna showed his mother the complete universal creation within his mouth, while she, immediately charmed by her son, wanted to look inside the mouth of the Lord just to see 
how much how much earth the child had eaten. By the grace of the Lord, the devotees are able to see everything in the universe within the mouth of the Lord. Everything in the universe is in the Lord's mouth. Well, Mother Yashoda could see like that. I don't know if we, how will we ever see like that? But we should understand, it's a fact, that it's, this is not just some mythology. This is the actual truth, the absolute truth is being described to us. So all of these different pastimes of Lord Krishna are very appropriate in the beginning because it helps us to understand the inconceivable nature of Lord Krishna's pastimes. And if we hear carefully about Lord Krishna's activities, then when we come later on to his more intimate activities, to the pastimes of the internal potency, then we won't have any problem, it will not be a difficulty to us. But when we hear about the external affairs, that will help us to understand more his inconceivable nature. External affair means just like creation, how the Lord creates, how he brought about this whole material creation. In the purport, text 16, Prabhupada gives an example just towards the end of the purport. Any person employed in government service, including the president, is a part and parcel of the entire government. Everyone is a government servant, but no one is the government himself. That is the position of all living entities in the government of Sri. In, in, that is the position of all living entities in the government of the Supreme Lord. No one can artificially claim the supreme position of the Lord. Everyone is meant to serve the purpose of the supreme whole. So this is the point, we're hearing about Lord Krishna's glories, we will be convinced to serve him. The more we hear and understand his transcendental glories, the more we will be willing to take up service and engage in his service. In text 17, so Maharaj Parikshit wants to know about the, the different ages and the duration of the creation. He wants to know about the different activities of the different incarnations of the Lord in different ages. Of course, these, some of these things will not be described until the 11th canto. There's that section in the 11th canto about the, the Lord's incarnations in each age. Uh, just reading from the purport of text 17, Maharaj Parikshit inquired from the great and learned sage Shukadeva Goswami about the different activities of such incarnations so that the incarnation of the Lord might be confirmed by his activities in the authoritative scriptures. Maharaj Parikshit was not to be carried away by the sentiments of the common man to accept an incarnation of the Lord very cheaply. Instead, he wished to accept the incarnations of the Lord by symptoms mentioned in the Vedic literature and confirmed by an acharya like Sukadeva Goswami. We saw earlier in chapter 6, Lord Brahma was describing the incarnations of the Lord. Was it, or maybe chapter 7? He began by speaking about Lord Varaha and describing about Lord Varaha's transcendental pastimes and went on gradually, after describing many more incarnations, he came to Lord Krishna. Because Lord Krishna is not just an ordinary incarnation, 
He is the source of all the incarnations. So he's not an avatar, but he's avatari, the, the origin of all the avatars. And Lord Krishna was able to give full description about his different mission and pastime here in this material world. So it's important for us that we hear these things in the proper manner. Lord Varaha came first. We hear how he takes birth from the nose of Brahma and how he can pick up the earth planet and put it back in position. Then we heard how Lord Nisringadev could fight with a great demon, half lion, half man. Lord Nisringadev is in the form half lion, half man, and he's fighting the great demon Haranyakashipu. And Haranyakashipu had terrorized all the demigods. And he had all the demigods serving him. Even Narada Muni was serving Haranyakashipu. So Lord Nishringadev appeared to protect his unalloyed devotee. And at the same time he portrayed more of the inconceivable nature of the Lord. How he can appear in any form. He's not limited to our understanding. So different incarnations of the Lord are described. But the ultimate form of the Lord is Lord Sri Krishna, who is the origin of all of these incarnations. But it's very bewildering, bewildering because we know Lord Krishna appears as a young boy. He's just a little boy with peacock feather in his hair. He looks so young and innocent. How can we understand his activities? We have to hear, we have to understand very carefully, I have to hear from the beginning. That's why it's very important to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam from the beginning. Don't just jump up to the tenth canto and hear Rasa Leela. That will, that will ruin us. Okay, going ahead, text 18, people also explain what may generally be the common religious affiliations of human society, as well as their specific occupational duties in religion, the classifications of the social order, as well as the administrative royal orders, and the religious principles for one who may be in distress. So we know in the Kali Yuga, many people are in distress. So just because we're in distress, does it mean we don't have to follow religious principles? We have to understand everything carefully. Just at the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, People following the principles of devotional service to the Lord can never be put into difficulty. And thus there cannot be any question of apada dharma or religion in distress. As will be explained in this book by the greatest authority, Sukadeva Goswami, there is no religion save and except the devotional service of the Lord though this may be presented in different forms. So the point is that, that it's not just all one, but there's so much variety, different forms, different manner of presentation. We see such a big difference between Lord Krishna, Lord Varaha, Lord Nishingadev, even between Lord Rama and Lord Krishna, there's a lot of difference. How we can, while there's differences, there's also points of uh, commonality, points which are the same. Because their, their mission is always the same. Paritranaya sadunam vinas chaya chaduskritam. To please the pious and to annihilate the miscreants. This is the process of devotional service. 
So in all of the forms of the Lord, that's what's happening. He's coming. He, mainly his purpose in coming is to please his devotees. Because he can kill the demons without coming. He doesn't have to come just to do that. He can just simply give them a heart attack and go. But he comes into this world and he performs pastimes. And these pastimes are very significant because this is the life of the devotees. The, the devotees, they, they get great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So it's very important for us also to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam and to hear about the Lord's pastimes. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was residing at Puri, he was regularly hearing the Lord's pastimes. He would hear about Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj. Those were his two favorites. Almost daily he would be coming to uh, see Gadarha Pandit at Tota Gopinath Temple and Gadarha would read Srimad Bhagavatam to Lord Chaitanya. Text 19. Kindly explain all about the elementary principles of creation. The number of such elementary principles, their causes, their developments, and also the process of devotional service and the method of mystic powers. What are the opulences of the great mystics and what is the ultimate realization? How does the perfect mystic become detached from the subtle astral body? What is the basic knowledge of the Vedic literature, including the branches of history and the supplementary Puranas? So, so many things Maharaj Pariksha is inquiring about. He wants to understand all of these things. He wants to hear about the great mystics like Durvasa Muni and then Lord Shiva. He's also a great yogi. And then we have Ambarish Maharaj, and his quarrel with Durvasa Muni. Then in the purport, Prabhupada picks up the example about Draupadi and how she didn't know anything about mystic powers, but she was able to save her chastity by some magical feet that the Lord appeared as an unlimited cloth and protected her chastity. It wasn't just simply due to some mystic power on the part of Draupadi, it was by her, by the Lord's own arrangement that the Lord came to protect his devotee. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about these different things. He wants to understand everything in course of time. Text 21. How are the living beings? How are the living beings generated? How are they maintained? How are they annihilated? Tell me of the advantages and disadvantages of devotional service. There's, uh, there's a, we, we, we know the advantages. What are the disadvantages of devotional service? <laughs> it's an interesting point. Maharaj Pariksit wants to hear both sides. And then he wants to know about the Vedic rituals, injunctions of the Vedic rituals the procedures, and so on. And so then, it's a long purport there in that text, text number 21. Uh, some important instructions from it. We do want to appreciate some of these different points which are made in these purports. Prabhupada wrote extensively in these purports, although they're just questions, but Prabhupada wrote a lot, long purpose, and that indicates he wants to give some important instructions. So if you look at the uh, first 
second, third paragraph, the long paragraphs, but the third paragraph, then it writes about the favourable condition for discharging devotional service. And that is that one should be very enthusiastic in serving the Lord. The Lord, in his form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, wanted the cult of devotional service to the Lord to be preached all over the world in every nook and corner. And therefore a pure devotee's duty is to discharge the order as far as possible. Every devotee should be very enthusiastic, not only in performing his daily rituals of devotional service, but in trying to preach the cult peacefully by following in the footsteps of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, we should be very enthusiastic not just in our own daily rituals, but in trying to preach. So this is the important point here. How much Prabhupada is emphasized, Prabhupada's mood and mission, you know, to get us all to go out there and preach, even though we may not like it. You know, we may feel, I don't like being out here, I don't like this, I don't like uh, go going up to people we don't know and so on. But this is actually the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Whoever you go, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. So we shouldn't feel in the bodily concept of life. We have to transcend that bodily conception of life. We have to think, I'm a devotee, I'm meant to serve Krishna, it's my duty, my duty to my guru is to go out and tell others about Krishna. And we should do this with great enthusiasm, right? What's the word for enthusiasm? Utsaha. 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 Yes, right. Utsaha. That's the first point given by Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Instruction, that there must be Utsaha. Enthusiasm. We have to have enthusiasm to go out and preach. If we're not enthusiastic, if we go out there to preach, how will we ever influence others? There has to be that enthusiasm, just like Prabhupada going to America at the age of 70. So when people would meet Prabhupada, they could understand, this man must be very convinced, he must be very serious. 70 years old, coming to America, not knowing anybody and no money, he must be really serious. He has to be very enthusiastic, very convinced. They must know it was something very genuine. So that way our own enthusiasm, Lord, when Lord Chaitanya was in uh, Mathura, he came to Mathura and he went to the, uh, the Adi Dev temple and he was chanting and dancing. And when he started chanting and dancing, another brahmana came and also began to dance with him. Now other people, there were many other people watching, but only one of them came and joined in. Now when somebody comes and joins in the chanting and dancing, that's very special, right? When some, your, Lord Chaitanya, he was dancing alone. He was, because Lord Chaitanya is always in ecstasy. So wherever he would go, you know, he'd go and see the deity, saw the deity of Krishna, he'd dance in ecstasy, singing, dancing. And then suddenly this other brahmana comes and he begins to dance with Lord Chaitanya. So Lord Chaitanya is surprised. He thought, who is this brahmana? Where did he come from? Right? Where did he come from? How did he become there to start to dance with Lord Chaitanya? Do you know the pastime? Yeah? Somebody? Anybody? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, was it that he had some contact with Madhavendra Puri? 
Yes, right, that's right. He had some contact with Madhavendra Puri. He had been initiated. He said previously Madhavendra Puri had come there and he had been initiated. He brought Madhavendra Puri to his house and he fed him and he took initiation from Madhavendra Puri. And because of that, he had the seed of love of God. So when Lord Chaitanya heard that, Lord Chaitanya offered obeisances to him. Why? Because he is a superior than uh, uh, on the on the platform of uh, the god brother of his spiritual master. Yes, he's the god brother of his own spiritual master. Lord Chaitanya was initiated by Ishwara Puri, and Ishwara Puri was also a disciple of Madhavendra Puri. So Lord Chaitanya offered obeisances to the Brahmana. He understood. Brahmana is also like my spiritual master. Of course, Brahmana was very humble. He said, no, no, you're sannyasi. I'm just a fallen Brahmana in householder life. But Lord Chaitanya gave him great respect. Anyway, there's a point that that enthusiasm is there, the utsahan, that can how how it's contagious. Lord Chaitanya was chanting and dancing. The Brahmana came, he chanted and danced. Prabhupada gave the example about Char Charlie Chaplin. Somehow Prabhupada had seen the Charlie Chaplin movies, and so he saw this one movie where. Charlie Chaplin was wearing a, a, you know, one of these tails, he, you know, a long jacket with a tail at the back. Uh, some old, uh, very conservative uh, dressing, which is a type of jacket which is worn. So it had big tails at the back and somehow the jacket got ripped. But in the movie, Charlie Chaplin, when his jacket got ripped, he just danced with greater enthusiasm. And he became so enthusiastic, everyone began to copy him. And they all went and ripped their jackets, just as his was ripped. They all went to copy him and they, they ripped their jackets and they were all dancing very enthusiastically. So Prabhupada was telling this to the devotees because they were going, he was sending them to the UK to preach. And they were going as devotees with shaved heads and dhotis and so on. So he wanted them to be very enthusiastic and not to feel any restrictions or inhibited by their dressing or by their uh, appearance. So like that, devotees should be very enthusiastic in everything. That is Krishna consciousness. We do, we're doing it for Krishna, so we're very enthusiastic. And Prabhupada tells us the important point is that uh, it's, don't, be, don't be attached by the result. If he is not superficially successful in such an attempt, he should not be deterred from the discharge of his duty. Success or failure has no meaning for a pure devotee because he's a soldier in the field. So sometimes we see devotees, they get discouraged. Oh, I tried to preach. I didn't get any result. Oh, I wasn't successful. But Prabhupada tells us here, don't worry about that. The results are not so important. What's important is the endeavor that we tried, we tried to do it. That's the important thing. And then Prabhupada said, preaching means like declaring war against the material energy. So then Prabhupada goes on to talk about uh, that we have to be careful about association don't associate with the atheists and don't be misled by the non-devotees. Non-devotees can also mean that they're neutral. 
that they're, they're not devotee, they're not inimical to the world, it's just neutral about things. So Prabhupada talks, he said, they, make, they may make some atheistic propaganda. And so we should be careful about who we associate with. A devotee should see to the right discharge of devotional service under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and should not stick only to the formalities. The formalities, you know, oh, there, there are many formalities, of course, which we have in devotional service. And, but Prabhupada said, what's important is uh, the discharge of devotional service under the teaching of the Guru. Just like Prabhupada told us, distribute, uh, distribute my books. Hmm. They, you know, for, the formalities are there, Mongol Arti, uh, go to the temple program and eat prasadam. But the important thing was Prabhupada wanted us to preach. Go out and preach. The, the formalities are there in the, the temple program. So in the beginning, devotees should be following the temple program. But then gradually, they're able to keep their Krishna consciousness and at the same time, maybe minimize to some extent the formalities. Just like another formality is the dress. Devotees will wear usually do dhoti and kurta. But Prabhupada also approved that devotees could wear civilian clothes and go out for preaching and distributing books. Not that everywhere we had to go in uh, dhoti and kurta. But for the sake of preaching and introducing Krishna consciousness in a society where people are very materialistic, Prabhupada proved that we could go in the civilian dress. So that's again going away from the formalities of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. Then towards the end of the purport, talks about uh, pious activities because it's mentioned there about pious acts in terms of religion. Purtashya, right? So it's mentioned in the purport. Pious acts are prescribed in the supplementary Vedas, Smriti, which specifically mention digging tanks, and wells for the water supply of the people in general. To plant trees on the public roads, to construct public temples, places of worship of God, to establish places of charity where the poor destitutes can be provided with foodstuffs and similar acts are called purta. Purta, meaning pious activities. So pious activities are not devotional service, right? These pious activities, they help us to get relief from sinful reactions, but they don't take away the desire for sin. So we, we want to understand the difference between pious activities and devotional service. Similarly, the process of fulfilling the natural desires for sense gratification was also inquired about by the king for the benefit of all concerned. Okay. Maharaj Parikshit has questions on so many topics. Uh, he wants to hear in text 23, the independent personality of Godhead enjoys his pastimes by his internal potency and at the time of annihilation gives them up to the external potency and remains a witness to it all. 
So this is Maharaj Pariksit desires to know more about Lord Krishna. He wants to understand about Lord Krishna's appearance and how Lord Krishna left this world. Text 24. Kindly satisfy my inquisitiveness in all that I have inquired from you and all that I may not have inquired from you from the very beginning of my questionings. Since I am a soul surrendered unto you, please impart full knowledge in this connection. So then Prabhupada talks about the relationship again between the spiritual teacher and the disciple. The duty of the disciple is to inquire and the duty of the guru is to satisfy the disciple. Text 25. O great sage, you are as good as Brahma. Sukhati, Maharaj Parikshit is glorifying Sukadeva Goswami. He's telling Sukadeva Goswami, you are as good as Brahma, the original living being. Others follow custom only, as followed by the previous philosophical speculators. And so in the purport, Prabhupada talks about the different philosophical systems, the great sages like Gautama, who gave us uh, logic, and then Kannada, who gave us the impersonal philosophy, and Jaimini gave us uh, Karma Mimamsa, and Kapila, the Sankhya philosophy, and Astavarka, also impersonalism, like the different philosophies from different great sages. So we want to hear about the philosophy which is given by Sukadeva Goswami, because Sukadeva Goswami, he heard from Vyasadev. And Srila Vyasadev is the di direct disciple of Narad. And Narad, of course, is the son of Brahma. Prabhupada writes in the purport there of text 25, just in the last paragraph, he says, the six great sages mentioned above, we just mentioned their names, right? Like uh, Kapila and Jaimini and uh, Patanjali and these people, and Astavakra. The, the, six, the six great sages, they may be great thinkers, but their knowledge by mental speculation is not perfect. However perfect an empirical philosopher may be in presenting a philosophical thesis, such knowledge is never perfect because it is produced by an imperfect mind. Such great sages also have their disciplic successions, but they are not authorized because such knowledge does not come directly from the independent Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan. Hmm. And then going on, mind is material and thus knowledge presented by man, material speculators, by material speculators is never transcendental and can never become perfect. Mundane philosophers being imperfect in themselves disagree with other philosophers because a mundane philosopher is not a philosopher at all unless he presents his own theory. So that's described, of course, that's uh, about the rishis. Tarko pratishta shruta yo vibhina na savrishi na tam vibhinam. Right? The great sages, the rishis, they each have their own philosophy, but someone will come along after him and they will defeat their philosophy. And then someone else will come and defeat that philosophy. And in this way, there's always competition going on for supremacy. Who is giving the highest philosophy? And somebody says, I'm the highest philosophy, and somebody else comes along and defeats him. So the ultimate conclusion is we accept the philosophy of Vedanta. 
which comes from Srila Vyasadeva, who wrote down the Vedas and he compiled the Vedanta Sutra. So it's Srila Vyasadeva Vedanta Darshan, which is actually the conclusion, the highest conclusion. And the Vedanta philosophy doesn't come by speculation. It comes through the parampara. Or the, Veda, the Vedic knowledge itself comes from the Lord. Tenhe Brahma Ridaya Adikavaye. Vedic knowledge was imparted into the heart of Lord Brahma. So we understand the importance of the parampara to get the absolute truth. Any other system cannot be effective. There will always be some fault. Text 26. Maharaj Pariksha is describing his own position. He said, because of my drinking the nectar of the message of the infallible personality of Godhead, which is flowing down from the ocean of your speeches, I do not feel any sort of exhaustion due to my fasting. Of course, we know if you're fasting, we just have to fast for one day. We know how exhausting it can be. You know, maybe you're going to do Bhisma Panchak at the end of the Chaturmasya, right? We have the last Ekadasi coming up. The next Ekadasi will be the first day of the Bhisma Panchak. And the tradition is you should do full fasting, near Jawi Kadasi on that particular day. We already had Pandava near Jau in the middle of the year. It comes in the very hot season. Bhisma Panchak uh, comes in a much cooler time of the year. You may like to perform uh, near Jawi Kadasi that day and then observe some fasting for the other days of Bhisma Panchak. But we know how exhausting it all is. But here you have Maharaj Parikshit. He's fasting you know, for several days. Well, of course, but we're only in second canto, so he hasn't been hearing for very long. But anyway, he says he doesn't feel any exhaustion due to fasting. So that is the nature of actually the transcendental platform when we're free from the bodily conceptions of life, then you don't feel that power, that demand of the material body. Text 27, Sutta Goswami speaks. Thus, Sukadeva Goswami, being invited by Maharaj Parikshit, to speak on topics of Lord Krishna with all the devotees was very much pleased. Yes, certainly he'd be very pleased that Maharaj Parikshit has given him so many nice topics to speak on. He's inquired on so many subject matters. It's a great opportunity for him to speak. So he's very happy to hear all of these questions. Okay, Sukadeva Goswami was protected by Lord Krishna, therefore he is known as Brahma Rata. And, and Sriman Parikshit Maharaj was also protected by Vishnu and thus he is known as Vishnu Rata. So Sukadeva Goswami was protected by Lord Krishna and Parikshit Maharaj was protected by Lord Vishnu. So as devotees of the Lord, they are always protected by the Lord. It is clear also in this connection that a Vishnu Rata should hear Srimad Bhagavatam from Brahma Rata and no one else because others misrepresent the transcendental knowledge and thus spoil one's valuable time. So Brahmarata, meaning protected by Lord Krishna from Brahma Vaya Okay, text 28, he began to reply to the inquiries of Maharaj Pariksit. First, 
by the Lord Himself, oh, saying that the silence of Godhead was spoken first by the Lord Himself to Brahma when He was first born. Srimad Bhagavatam is a supplementary Vedic literature and it is just in pursuance of the Vedas. He also prepared himself to reply to all that King Parikshit had acquired from him. Maharaj Parikshit was the best in the dynasty of the Pandus, thus he was able to ask the right questions from the right person. Maharaj Parikshit asked many questions from the purport, some of them very curiously to know things as they are, but it is not necessary for the master to answer them in the order of the disciples' inquiries, one after the other. But Sukadeva Goswami, experienced teacher that he was, answered all the questions in a systematic way they were received from the chain of disciplic succession, and he answered all of them without exception. Okay, are there any questions or comments? This is Maharaj Pariksha's questions. We see his enthusiasm and his seriousness, his commitment to hear about Krishna doesn't want to hear about anything else. He's not concerned about the demigods. He's not concerned about ritualistic activities. He just wants to hear about Krishna and Krishna and Krishna's energies. And we will be hearing about that in the next chapter. Any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Pradhatana. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I have like little confusion. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, time is also mentioned as eternal. But uh, in spiritual world, we do not have time. And uh, this material world is also temporary. Like it's manifested and unmanifested. So why is the time eternal? Well, you say we don't have time in the spiritual world, but actually there is time. There is time in the spiritual world, but it doesn't have the decaying effect which it has in the material world. There has to be time in the spiritual world because it's, it allows Lord Krishna, it facilitates the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Just like Lord Krishna goes off to the forest every day. Every morning he's going to go to the forest, in the spiritual world, in Goloka Vrindavan. He'll go off to the forest every morning. The gopis will watch him go off to the forest and they will follow him even and accompany him as he goes into the forest. And then they'll wait anxiously for him to come home at night. And at night also the gopis will enjoy pastimes with Lord Krishna. So there is the impression of time in the spiritual world for the purpose of Lord Krishna's pastimes, but it doesn't have the decaying effect which it has in the material world. Right? Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else has any question or something for discussion? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Um, sure. In the text 21, the text that we were speaking of uh, about enthusiasm, Prabhupada writes in the purport, a devotee should not hanker after anything, but he should be satisfied with things that may automatically come to him by the will of the Lord. So how do we understand, how to strike a balance of are we, or are we trying to, to go, uh, uh, to, are we doing it in a practical way? This is something that is needed practically or am I hankering for it? How do we understand that? 
yes, we have to see what is actually Krishna's plan. We, we want to, you know, we will endeavour, we have to endeavour for things, but at the same time we're told not to over-endeavour. Don't be too much attached to the results. At the same time, that doesn't mean we should not endeavour. There should be some endeavour there. But the, the idea is that, that we should not over-endeavour. We should not endeavour to the extent that nothing else is there, that we're not thinking about anything else but only this. Our motivation has to be for Krishna, for the pleasure of Krishna. So if Krishna wants, he will, he will allow it, he will give us. If Krishna doesn't want, then it doesn't matter how much we endeavour, we'll not be successful. So we make an effort on our part to try to, you know, we want something, we have some desires, we want to do something, achieve something, and we will try, we'll, we'll work, we'll work hard. But at the same time, we will, not, we will not work so hard to the extent that we lose our total uh, consciousness of Krishna and we're only thinking about the result. That attachment to the result, that, this is a problem. Why we want that result? We're thinking that will bring me happiness, that will bring me the comfort or the security that I want. We have to understand Krishna is the ultimate controller. We are just simply the instruments in His service. So we endeavour. But at the same time, we have to understand Krishna is the real doer. We are simply instruments in His service. So we try, but we don't give up our sadhana just to achieve it. Just like devotee may be building a big temple, maybe you're building a temple for Krishna. And you're working so hard to build the temple, that you don't chant anymore, you don't do any chanting, that's not good. And so we have to work for Krishna, but at the same time we have to keep Krishna conscious. We have to go on with our regular program, hearing and chanting. You have to make time to chant Hare Krishna. You have to make time to take prasadam. Just like we may say, oh, I have no time, I have no time to offer, and we just want to eat. No, we have to offer the food to Krishna. Right? We have to offer, we have to eat prasadam. We cannot take what is not offered to Krishna. So the, we, have to, we have to be careful how much we get caught up in our endeavours, over-endeavouring for mundane things difficult to achieve is one of the problems of fall down. Remember from the nectar of instruction, over endeavouring for mundane things difficult to achieve. That can be a cause of fall down. So how do we know what is, what is over endeavouring and what is too difficult for us to achieve, you will know when we start trying to work for it. Do we get the result? Does Krishna give it? Now Prabhupada, we saw Prabhupada's example. You know, Prabhupada wanted to establish Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada didn't worry about getting big buildings. He didn't worry about money. He didn't worry about these kind of things. He just let Krishna take care of it. You know, if the opportunity came, okay. Yeah. If you get the building, oh, okay, very good, very nice. You don't have the building, oh, no problem, go on, keep chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, then you can see the story that they landed Juhu. There was a bit of a struggle there. There was a struggle. 
Prabhupada had given the money for the land and the man had taken the money but he wanted to keep the land. He wanted to cheat Prabhupada and the man was very influential. He had a lot of contacts, connections with the government and with the city and the police and everything. Then he convinced the, uh, the, the, everybody that Hare Krishna had cheated him. But actually he tried to cheat Prabhupada. So it was a struggle, there was a struggle. But yeah, of course, yes, certainly some things we do have to struggle for. But we don't forget Krishna, ultimately. You have to always remember Krishna. You don't struggle so much that you've no time to chant Hare Krishna. Remember, the struggle is to remember Krishna and to take to keep the shelter at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Now, if you forget about Krishna consciousness in the course of that struggle, then that is not good. That is fault. That is over endeavor. Just like. Coming up to December and devotees will work to distribute literature. We have usually we we would call it the Prabhupada Marathon. And we would try to distribute as many literatures as possible. So devotees will go out and try to distribute books. But at the same time, they have to keep up their sadhana. They have to still chant. They have to still remember. They can't think, oh, because I'm distributing books, I don't need to chant. Just like some people think, I'm the pujari, I'm worshipping the deity, I don't need to chant. That's very wrong. Somebody who's a pujari, they have a duty to chant. They must chant. More important. And the cook, oh, I'm a cook, I don't chant. Oh, you're cooking for Krishna, you're cooking for the devotee, you must chant. First business. So we have to understand these, these principles. It's important for us as devotees to not to sacrifice on all of these things just for the sake of material prosperity, you know, for economic development and for our own sense gratification. That's not good. So, being satisfied is a quality of a brahmana. The brahmana is meant to be satisfied. If you're working as a brahmana, then brahmanas, you know, they don't get rich usually. They may be rich, but not usually. They're usually simple people, they live in simple basic homes, and they don't worry about opulence, because they're brahmanas. They're doing brahminical duties. Brahminical duties mean thing that they will teach the scriptures and they will study the scriptures themselves. And they will worship the deity and they will teach others to worship the deity. And they can accept charity and they can also give charity. So that's what brahmanas are meant to be doing. And they're meant to be satisfied with whatever income comes their way. They don't have to demand a salary, they would just simply depend. People may give charity, they may not. They don't worry about it. They just simply perform their duty. And sometimes they may receive, sometimes they may even go begging. Whatever is required, but they'll be happy, they'll be satisfied that they're performing their duty according to religious principles. Of course, somebody is doing business, you're a Vaishya, then you know it's a little difficult to be satisfied, you know. <laughs> it's a little, you know, it's not quite the same like a Brahmana. Brahmana's duty and a Vaishya's duty are different. Brahman, Bra Vaishya, of course, is. It's going to make some profit. It's going to make some uh, profit when he sells the goods. And similarly, the farmer, Nanda Maharaj, was not poor. Nanda Maharaj was a Vaishya. He had many cows. And his wife was decorated with 
very nice ornaments and so on. So we have to know what is our actual religious duty. For a brahmana should be satisfied. If the mind is agitated all the time for more, it's not good. We're always saying, I don't have enough, I, need, I want more, I want more. That is not the mode of goodness. The mode of goodness means to be satisfied. And we should come to the mode of goodness, although you may not be brahminical so much in your life, but we should come to the mode of goodness, because from the mode of goodness then it's easy to transcend. If you're always in the mode of passion and ignorance, then it's more difficult to transcend. It's going to be very difficult to come out of the modes of nature. So it's recommending come up to the mode of goodness and then once you're in the mode of goodness then you can transcend more easily. So being satisfied means controlling the mind and accepting what comes by the grace of Krishna without over endeavor. All right? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Any, is there any other question? Okay. If there's no more question, tomorrow we're going to go on to chapter 9. And that's where the Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam is. So we'll be going, looking, coming up to that. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.